The information provided in the interviews and on the website of the Autism, ADHD, and Sensory Processing Disorder Summer is for information and educational purposes only. It is not intended to diagnose or treat your child and is not a substitute for working with a qualified practitioner. There are many gifted, passionate, and knowledgeable practitioners with hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours of clinical experience. Part of our goal is to give you the knowledge and tools you need to effectively advocate for your child. No one knows your child better than you. No one knows your child's history and can better judge what's normal and abnormal for your child. The greatest success in recovery comes with the parent being informed and asking the right questions and making the best decisions for their child in coordination with a team of qualified practitioners in different areas of specialty. Enjoy the summit. Hi everyone, I wanna welcome back to the Autism ADHD and Sensory Processing Disorder Summit, Dr. Elisa Song. I'm so happy to have you here again this year. Um, Dr. Song is of the Holistic Mama Doc, and she's a holistic pediatrician, pediatric functional medicine expert, and mama to two crazy fun kids. In her integ integrative pediatric practice, Whole Family Wellness, she's helped thousands of kids get to the root causes of their health concerns and helped their parents understand how to help their children thrive body, mind, and spirit by integrating conventional pediatrics with functional medicine, homeopathy, acupuncture, herbal medicine, and essential oils. These health concerns have ranged from frequent colds, ear infections, asthma, eczema, to autism, ADHD, anxiety, depression, and autoimmune illness. Dr. Song is the host of the Thriving Child Summit, a life-changing event for parents to learn how to help their children thrive. And Dr. Song has created Healthy Happy Kids to share her advice and adventures as a holistic pediatrician and a mama. Now um, everyone can have their very own virtual holistic pediatrician. You can follow her blog at Healthy Kids Happy Kids and get daily tips and inspiration from her on Facebook. Dr. Song is so glad to have you back here again. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be back. I had a great time last year and hoping to share even more information with all the listeners. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, one of the things that um, has been coming up a lot and we're getting a lot of questions around um, the, what seems to be an epidemic of kids that ha are having trouble with what, what we believe is pans and pandas mm -hmm. and, um, having symptoms like OCD and tics, and it seems to be a prevalence in a lot of the kids that have autism or ADHD. Um, they've already got compromised immune systems and their parents aren't quite sure what this is all about, why it's happening and what to do about it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think um, many parents have at this point now heard of PANS or PANDAS. And like you said, they're wondering, does my child fit into that picture? And, you know, as, as I'm going to share with you today, that picture isn't entirely clear. And I do think that, yes, many of our kids on the spectrum or, or with ADHD or with sensory processing issues, they do have underlying PANS or PANDAS, whether or not it was the trigger to the neurodevelopmental symptoms or is a complicating factor. So I think, you know, the knowledge is power. So we want parents to understand, you know, if they have any suspicions, how do they go about figuring out if this is what their kid has and you know, how do you treat it? Yeah, I, I think that's, that is one of the things that everybody's a little bit confused about because there's a lot of crossover right now in terms mm -hmm. of people talking about, is it an autism symptom? Is it a pans or a panda symptom? And in the end, I think what you're going to probably point out to everybody today is that we want to just look at the, what, what's going on at the root and um, address that. And, and then those, hopefully those symptoms will start to fade away. That's right. You know, I'm so glad you said that because, you know, when, when parents come to me and their kids are sick with whatever, whatever is going on, I mean, whether it's an autoimmune illness or whether it's, you know, asthma or whether it's autism or, um, you know, sensory issues, I tell parents, you know, the diagnosis helps me understand maybe part of what's going on, but it doesn't really matter, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and, you know, in a lot of ways, I don't necessarily want to know the diagnosis per se, because that can pigeonhole some practitioners into just looking at, you know, um, one or two kind of pathophysiologic mechanisms, right? And, you know, with functional medicine and, and integrated pediatrics, what we're looking at, as you said, is what, are, what is the root cause or root causes? What are the triggers and the underlying biomedical and biochemical, you know, clinical imbalances? 
And then we do the detective work and we figure out how to heal your child. But um, in, in the end, in a way, it doesn't matter, you know, what label your child has been given. What I want to know is what's going on underneath, right? And kind of heal your child from the inside out. And, and that does take detective work, but fortunately there are more and more practitioners doing that. Yeah. Well, and that's why conversations like this are so important because it helps parents um, know what types of things they should be sharing with their practitioners too, so they can help them uh, in the process of figuring out what's going on. That's right. That's right. Because, you know, some things that if you, if you're working with a, um, you know, an, an astute practitioner, right. Who really understands functional medicine um, you may have some concerns that you feel that you've been told by other practitioners aren't relevant to what's going on with your child, but it could be very relevant that your child has, you know, low muscle tone or, you know, fatigues easily or, you know, has significant regressions when they're sick. I mean, those are all things that I want to know because they give me tips as to um, where should I do more of the investigation. Yeah. Well, and I'm really glad you uh, went to the trouble today to prepare um, a set of slides for us, which is really great because I'm a visual as well as an auditory learner. So I uh, appreciate that. And, and uh, I'm sure a lot of the parents will today too, as you talk us through which, what, you know, what is a relatively complicated um, set of circumstances that, that results. Um, yes. Explain. Yes. So I, I can totally dive right in. Um, this is as of um, this summit, um, I will have given a much um, more kind of in-depth, longer version of this talk to you by uh, uh, functional medicine practitioners in Australia. Um, but I want to share this with the parents uh, and, and, and the practitioners listening, because you're right, this is such a it's a complicated area and we're really, you know, we're just at the start of understanding what's going on with our kids. So I will share my screen right here and um, there we go. Let's get to the slideshow here. And I think we're on, right? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, so we're going to be talking about this epidemic of pans and pandas in our kids and what we can do about it, you know, from that foundation of understanding um, the root causes and the core clinical imbalances. And so when we think about the epidemic of childhood neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders, the numbers are astounding, right? I mean, these are numbers that I mean, they're, they're crazy to me and they shouldn't be this way. And we need to figure out what's going on and why our kids are so sick. But, you know, as most of the parents listening know, autism rates are skyrocketing. And that number now, you know, it, it is, I mean, this, this is from 2014. So by now, 2018, these numbers are likely worse. And back then, one in 68 kids had, were diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. There's certain pockets like New Jersey and California where we have higher numbers. Um, of course, I'm from New Jersey and I live in California now, so I'm kind of you know, getting that, that double whammy. But um, if we go along this trajectory, uh, it's very likely that by 2033, which is, I mean, right around the corner, that's 15 years from now, uh, one in four kids will have a diagnosis of autism. And it's not just autism, it's a whole host of other neuropsychiatric disorders. Now, you know, one in four teenagers are diagnosed with anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. And one in 15 has a severe anxiety disorder. But it's not just that. I mean, I look at the young kids in my, in my practice that I see in preschool. I mean, literally, they're four and five, and they're being diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, mm -hmm. right? And so... You know, if we give them that diagnosis as toddlers and as elementary school kids, where do they have to go? You know, they're being put on Lexapro or um, Lamictal or you name it. I mean, any host of kind of new, new medications and, you know, what's the end in sight, right? And then we have depression, you know, one in maybe 10 to 15 teenagers has depression. And, you know, any mental disorder in a teenager I mean, almost one in two teens has a mental disorder. And of course, we have this social media, which is fueling this epidemic of anxiety and depression in our teens. So, um, you know, we're just in this massive social experiment. And, and, you know, I don't think we, we're just at the tip of the iceberg of understanding the implications that social media has, you know, for our kids. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's one of the things that we can't control, unfortunately, except for to take those devices away, but it's a tough, yeah, tough call. Yeah, it's, it is really tough. And then we have pans and pandas, right? We're going to go into what that is, but, um, and I, you know, I'm going to actually, you know, if I'm 
uh, I'd love to kind of uh, tell side stories to Tara. If I'm, <laughs> if I'm rambling and we're running out of time, let me know because I don't have a clock right in front of me. <laughs> yeah. um, but pans and pandas. So many of us have heard of these terms and wondering, okay, do, do my kids have pans or pandas? And it's very likely that at least one in 200 U.S. kids has pans or pandas. Um, you know, as, and as many as one in four kids with OCD and tick disorders may have pandas. Um, you know, I, again, as we start to understand more and more about pans and pandas, we likely will diagnose more kids um, and have a better understanding of exactly how many kids. Um, I did do for this conference that I'm teaching at in, in Australia, this functional medicine conference, I did a two-part interview on pans and pandas. Um, I mean, they're each over an hour long, so if parents want to check that out. And it, it was mainly for practitioners, but um, I, I go into a ton of depth there. Um, but you know, I didn't have some of this information I'm sharing with you today. Um, so pans and pandas often misdiagnosed and very likely underdiagnosed. So we need to understand what, what this is. You know, how do we diagnose pans and pandas? Um, and if you look to really see how parents learn about pans and pandas, it's usually not from their pediatrician. I mean, this is a survey, a 2014 pandas parent survey, you know, from San Francisco. And um, only 6% of parents learned about pans or pandas from their pediatrician. About a third, at least over a third, found it on their own, right, you know, from Facebook groups and from their other communities or from other specialists. And how long did it take to get the diagnosis? Look at this. A third got diagnosed maybe in less than six months if they had a really keen pediatrician or, you know, therapist or maybe um, a counselor at school who was familiar with pans and pandas and understood um, and saw the red flags and, and took that parent aside and said, hey, maybe you want to, you know, look to see if your child might have this condition, right? But then we see, look at this, a third of kids, right, took over three years to get diagnosed. And then you have this vast range in between, right? But that's too long. You know, those three years, parents are suffering, kids are suffering, right? They're, they're likely not functioning in school and socially. So we need to get the diagnosis quicker. Um, and how many doctors did, did kids see prior to a pandas diagnosis? Look at this, I mean, almost 90%. So the vast majority saw more than three doctors, right? And more than half saw five plus doctors. So we need to make sure that, you know, it's, it's parents, right? It's, it's, it's us as mothers and fathers or grandparents, you know, who need to be our kids' best advocates, even if your practitioner is saying, no, it's not pandas or pans. I mean, I've had, um, you know, um, I've diagnosed kids with pandas and, you know, they've, had such remarkable recovery and you know of course then they've gone back to I mean this one girl went back to her um, psychiatrist she had been seeing for years because she had struggled so much and um, and was told by by the psychiatrist no you don't have pandas so you know <laughs> you know we need to kind of take take that with a grain of salt find our team who can work with us and and support us as we go through this journey so the most common initial diagnosis, OCD and anxiety, right? You know, if your child has been diagnosed with OCD or generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder, um, think about, you know, whether or not pandas or pans could be in the mix. And then you have a whole host of other diagnoses as well. You know, if your child was not exhibiting ADHD symptoms earlier and they all of a sudden are having these executive functioning attention issues, focus issues that are coming up, you know, in later elementary school or middle school, well, think, you know, what's the change there? Could it possibly be pandas or pans? So what is pandas or pans, right? Pans stands for pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome. So pans is this umbrella term that can be triggered by many different things, infections and non-infectious triggers. And pandas is a subset of pans. Okay, so pandas is pans when it's triggered by strep. Okay, and panda stands for pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcal infections. So this graphic, I think, helps a little bit more for uh, parents to see what PANS and, and PANDAS is. So you see PANS um, can then branch off and have infectious triggers or non-infectious triggers. Um, up at the top, if strep is the infectious trigger, then we call it PANDAS, right? But we can have a whole host of other infections that, that can trigger PANS, um, including influenza virus, Lyme and its co-infection, these very common childhood infections like herpes 6, which is the roseola virus, or parvovirus B19, which is the slap cheek virus. Um, 
Epstein-Barr, mycoplasma. Um, and then we have these non-infectious triggers, which we don't know as much about in terms of diagnosing and treating, but environmental toxins are big. You know, mold exposure. If you've had a, a leak in your house and there are mycotoxins and all of a sudden, ever since then, your child hasn't been the same, look for mold. We, wanna, we want the history to guide, you know, what's going, what, what, how to look for the trigger. Um, heavy metals, other environmental toxins, even metabolic disorders like lupus or diabetes, we need to we need to assess if the history fits. Right, this is giving you a snapshot of you know what are the potential triggers. It doesn't mean we have to test for every single one, right? I mean, if your child has had recurrent strep throat or just sore throats, um, and then after one particularly bad infection they're not the same, then we look for strep or maybe Epstein-Barr, which can cause um, sore throat as well, right? So let history be your guide. Um, what, and this is, uh-huh. Just what would you say about um, the acute onset aspect of it? So you might be getting into this, but- I am, yeah. Yeah, okay, because that, that's, that's the part that I think a lot of parents, what, what that means and, and how important that is. So I'll, right. let you, I'll let you get to that though. Yeah, so, you know, PANS and PANS, what I wrote here at the bottom, bottom line, it remains a clinical diagnosis. We have some testing that we can do, but it remains a clinical diagnosis. And this is the currently the, uh, the diagnostic criteria. And you'll see that PANS is defined by an abrupt, dramatic onset of OCD or severely restricted food intake. Symptoms are not explained by a known neurologic or medical disorder and two of the additional accompanying symptoms at least. Right, and with PANDAS as well, it's this abrupt onset of symptoms or a relaxing and remitting course of symptom severity. Now, I will say in my practice, um, I'll see kids presenting in many other ways, and you know, I work closely with the the docs over at the Stanford PANDAS Clinic. I mean, they're they're my next door neighbors, and uh, we share many patients. They send a lot of their patients over uh, because they they have strict criteria for admission. And what they want are the kids who literally, so neurotypical baseline, and then overnight, rages, OCD, ticks, can't leave the house, you know, can't, can't go out of their door, right? Restricted food, not eating, um, or these severely OCD behaviors around food, um, you know, uh, handwriting decline, behavioral regressions. Well, I'll tell you, the vast majority of kids that I see and we do the digging, it's not this dramatic onset. And this is where, you know, the many kids who have underlying autism or sensory issues or ADD will be excluded from this diagnosis, right? Because it's not so abrupt. You know, a lot of kids, you know, and, and, and then, you know, many kids don't have that neurotypical baseline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be honest, I mean, <laughs> What kids do you know that truly, truly have a 100% neurotypical baseline? I mean, how many kids have sensory issues? They're not impeding their lifestyle, right? But, but they maybe have go through phases where they have tics. In fact, they're transient tics of childhood, right? Or have occasional sensory issues that you know are more dramatic at times than others. I mean, I totally remember my kids who I would say they are neurotypical, but they've each gone through phases of sensory where I'm like, oh my gosh, it's taking half an hour or an hour to get out the door because their shoes aren't tight enough, right? Um, and so, or like they just, like my son, you know, the, the shirt was just hanging down too low, right? The clothes were just not right. And so, you know, are they totally neurotypical? I, you know, it's so hard to say, right? And so, the, what I see, and you know, this is where these are the, the frequent pan symptoms I see. A lot of times I'll see this urinary change, whether they're waking up a lot to pee or they just feel like um, there's, there's still some urine there. Handwriting decline is big if your kids are still uh, are at the point where they're writing or just fine motor, right? If they're drawing and, and you know, they're drawing these beautiful faces and rainbows and butterflies and all of a sudden you look in there and you're like, what is this? I can't even tell what they're trying to draw, right? Um, this cognitive uh, processing where kids just literally, you know, you ask them questions and they don't seem like they're getting it like they used to, right? And you're just wondering, are, is it that they haven't heard me? Are they not getting what I'm asking? Um, and of course, you have all of the, you know, the anxiety piece and the separation anxiety and um, the, the emotional liability. Sometimes there's rages. Um, it, this is really hard to, to 
um, kind of tease out in kids on the spectrum. And I have diagnosed kids on the spectrum, even kids with um, moderate to severe autism with PANS or PANDAS, because there's a change. So what I want parents to think about, is there a change, mm -hmm. right? And for one child in particular, there was a change. I mean, yes, he had behavioral issues and elopement issues and, and you know, aggressive issues, but there was something that shifted where all of a sudden, and the mom was so astute, right? I mean, you know, mamas, you know your kids best, where she could tell the way he was communicating was not the same, mm -hmm. right? He just wasn't getting her questions and able to type back um, in, in the same way. And there were a lot more OCD behaviors that looked like stimming, but it was just different, right? So we're looking at, is there a difference, right? You know, these are toddlers who, you know, maybe um, baby sister or brother is born and they start to regress, which is totally normal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they start to have more separation anxiety and more fears. And you're thinking, well, it's developmentally appropriate given their age and they have a new sibling, right? Or they moved home or the parents got divorced. Whatever kind of excuse you want to put on it, these are phases that we as parents, we watch our kids go through and you're kind of holding your breath thinking, okay, this is just a phase. Let's just get through it. But then six months later, a year later, two years later, it's not gone and it's not a phase anymore, right? And so, you know, we don't necessarily want to jump on every single kind of um, peak in, in anxiety um, when there's been a change, like a new teacher or a sibling birth. I mean, you know, that's not, it's not always going to be pans. And in fact, it probably isn't pans for most kids, right? But we don't want to ignore it, especially when it's not going away and it's not something um, that, um, that you can explain otherwise, right? So, yeah, yeah, that's I, right. This, right. Is, this is incredibly helpful, this slide, because, um, and especially the, what you've talked about now about it not always being an abrupt, uh, dramatic onset, because I think that a lot of parents have had suspicions, uh, but because we've been told it is about this acute onset, it's part of the diagnostic term, um, you just sort of move on and yeah. this, could, yep. this could really be enlightening for a lot of parents uh, yeah. who had, had suspicions, but, but had just ruled it out. And then the challenging part is going to be to find a practitioner who doesn't adhere right to those strict criteria, because I do think that many, many kids are missed. And I think back, you know, when I started my practice, you know, back in, you know, 2004, this is almost 15 years ago. And I think, I wonder, gosh, did I miss it in these kids? Right. But we just didn't know. I mean, you know what you know, but now, you know, many practitioners not enough, but many practitioners are, are aware of this phenomena of this thing called pans or pandas. But if it's not abrupt and sudden, they're just completely discounting the possibility. So, you know, as parents, you know, just you want to, you know, know that it is a possibility and find a practitioner who can maybe do the appropriate testing for you, right? Because if we don't know, we can't treat it. And if we don't treat it, it's not going to get better. Yeah. Right. Um, and so PANS is, it is an autoimmune phenomena. The immune system has gone awry. Something has happened where these um, infections or toxic, you know, exposures in a healthy immune system, we should, our children should be able to manage and deal with it. Um, it's not dealing with it appropriately and literally, you know, creating these auto antibodies, these antibodies that um, are attacking the brain, attacking the nervous system, right? I don't, I don't go into uh, depth into this particular test, but there is a test called the Cunningham panel by Molecular Labs, which I find useful, not necessarily as a first line test, but when it's, when the labs aren't clear and I just want to know, okay, I don't have a clear trigger. I'm not identifying the clear trigger because maybe I don't know how to test for it. There are certainly going to be triggers that we can't identify. Um, but, um, if, if I do the molecular Cunningham panel and I see that, wow, this kid has, you know, three different antibodies, autoimmune antibodies attacking different parts of the brain, like the dopamine receptors or, you know, tubulin in the brain and has highly elevated levels of something called CAM kinase, which is an enzyme that basically creates kind of erratic um, brain activity. Then I know I don't have a trigger. I can't, I've tested all the, all the infections. I've looked for mold. I've looked for heavy metals, but 
something's going on. I need to treat this child as though they have pans and an autoimmune reaction and, and manage that. Um, so we don't know the entire pathophysiology, but we do know that um, TH17, this arm of the immune system, is involved as it is in many autoimmune phenomena. And you know, research is ongoing. We're going to keep getting more and more information on what's going on. And as we understand the pathophysiology better, then we can better target the treatments. Um, but bottom line, early diagnosis and treatment is key for recovery, right? I mean, that's, you, you got to know what's going on. You got to do the digging and, and then, you know, we can help your kids, you know, for multiple reasons. You know, the longer this uh, kind of autoimmune process is set, the harder it is to, to reboot and rebalance and restore your child's immune system, right? Um, and then also we have... The, the psychosocial piece and the emotional piece where the longer these patterns get set, the harder it is, you know, even with CBT and the best therapy, you know, to, to unravel that part of it, right? And that emotional memory and those PTSD type symptoms in, in the child and the siblings and the parents, right? And kind of the whole kind of circle that, you know, then gets smaller and smaller and smaller because parents then become isolated because they can't bring their kids out, right? Their kids aren't going to school. They're not getting the social supports that, that are needed. So we don't want that to happen. And I know some parents listening that has been happening, right? And it, I mean, it breaks my heart that, that, you know, kids and parents and families are suffering and the siblings, right? We can't forget the siblings. So this is where, you know, it, there, there, there is hope if you're going through that, you know, there is support. And I know there's so many great Facebook groups now for, um, for PANS and PANDAS um, that practitioners aren't on. I'm not on them, right? I want that, you know, there, there should be a safe place for parents to talk about their treatments and what they're finding works and what doesn't work and, um, you know, really uh, understand maybe some of the options that uh, your practitioner isn't, isn't telling you. Um, I love when parents come back to me and say, you know, I found, I'm just hearing on my, on my PANS group or my PANDAS group about this potential treatment option, or have you heard of this, you know, therapy? Um, and sometimes I haven't, sometimes I haven't, and I love learning about new things, right? Because we, none of us has all the answers, right? And, and it does take a team approach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, then, okay, once we, once we have figured out, okay, this is what's going on, Right, what do we do? We need to take that, that root cause, functional medicine, integrative approach. So once we've identified the triggers, and again, the triggers can be infectious or non-infectious, the infectious triggers, uh, the, you know, the diagnosis, how do you diagnose that? Well, mostly it's gonna be blood work, checking for IgG and IgM antibodies. And knowing that, and this is where, you know, for parents to understand too, um, the difference between an IgM antibody and an IgG antibody. So when we have an acute infection, you know, let's say you, um, you know, you have um, Epstein-Barr, right? Uh, which is the monovirus. Uh, immediately, when you first get that infection, your IgM antibodies are going to rise. Right, that's IgM antibodies are your antibodies we make in the acute active stage of infection. Over time in a healthy normal immune system, those IgM antibodies should drop and then IgG antibodies go up and stay at a low level. IgG antibodies are our memory antibodies, right? However, for many kids who have PANS and PANDAS, right, or Epstein-Barr is also causative in chronic fatigue syndrome, what happens is, you know, the immune system is not functioning. So all of a sudden you have these IgG antibodies that all of a sudden, you know, um, over time go up and stay up. And so we have these very, very elevated IgG antibodies, which we know can indicate not so much in a very recent infection, but a chronically active persistent infection. Because years after an Epstein-Barr infection or years after whatever infection, there's no reason your immune system should have to churn out all of those antibodies. So I do want parents to understand that too, and practitioners listening, you can have these persistently elevated IgG antibodies that, that can indicate that that is an issue. Another issue is that over time, let's say your child, you know, Gosh, in toddler years, I've had kids where we're suspicious that probably the infectious trigger occurred when they were toddlers. And I mean, toddlers, I mean, that's like such a moving target, right? Every week your kid is different, right? So it's hard to know what was the exact moment in time, but, but some parents have this suspicion and, and we can trace it back. And so now if they come to me and their kids are seven, eight, you know, nine, 
And we're presuming they've had this infection or infections for you know, years now. Um, Chronic infections stress the immune system out. So eventually we find a lot of kids, their white blood cell count starts to drop or their total IgG, their immunoglobulin type G levels start to drop um, because of their immune system is stressed. And that's a little bit of a nuance there, but for those kids, we suspect if they've had chronic infections, even low levels of these antibodies could be significant. So this is where really you wanna you know, have a practitioner who can understand some of these nuances. Um, you know, there's also a link between kids who have something called CVID or underlying combined variable immunodeficiency. They already have an immunodeficiency um, in their gamma, in their um, IgG levels. And so um, they may not have elevated IgG levels either, right? So it becomes this, uh, you know, cycle, but we just need to understand all of that. So these are the steps that I take with kids when they have PANS or PANDAS, right? You want to first identify the trigger, of course. Step one is to treat the root causes, right? And treat the trigger. We got to get rid of whatever, whatever the trigger is or the triggers are. Step two is to put out the fire, right? Get rid of the inflammation, protect the brain from further um, uh, insult from the inflammation. Uh, step three is keeping the fire down, right? Because we can bring down the inflammation, but we don't want the inflammation to go right back up, right? And this is where what we will see. That's why pandas and pans, they have, it has, if pans and pandas flares, flaring is more the norm than not, right? I do have kids, you know, I have these uh, uh, incredible kids where we've identified strep or other infection, we treat it and that's it at least knock on wood that I can see, right? And they're out of the woods. We're still kind of always holding our breath when they have a little cold or a flu bug, but you know, they're not having these flares, but that's not typical. So this is a journey. This is, you know, you need practitioners and therapists who can be with you for the long haul because the typical, the typical journey is once we can find the trigger, your kids will get better, but then they have a flare, right? You know, when they get another exposed to strep again, and then they get better and then they have another flare, right? But what we're looking for overall an up, upward trajectory. But if we can keep the fire down, balance the immune system, we're gonna have flares that are far and few between and maybe not at all, okay? The next step is to address all of the other core clinical imbalances, right? You don't wanna just, you know, I see some, some practitioners and parents making the mistake of just going after the infection. Let's kill the infection, let's fight the inflammation. But, you know, we're not just, you know, an immune system, we're a gut, we're a brain, we're an endocrine system, right? We, you need to really look at the whole child and address whatever other imbalances are there from that functional medicine standpoint. And then this last, well, it's a fifth piece, is restoring that body, mind, spirit connection that has been so shattered during this time, right? Uh, we really do need to um, uh, help our kids and our parents and our siblings to manage their stress. So we're going to go through all those. And last, the last piece is integrative care, right? You know, functional medicine is amazing, but it's not the only piece, right? I mean, that's why I practice homeopathy and, and herbal medicine and essential oils and acupuncture and acupressure. And then there's so many other pieces, chiropractic, Ayurvedic, um, Reiki, right? There's so many other pieces that have a role, um, but not all practitioners, I mean, you, uh, any practitioner can't do it all, <laughs> right? You just can't, right? And no. so, you know, exploring those integrative approaches. Um, so should I go into each of these in, in more depth? Yeah, that would the be different great. Steps? I, I think okay. it would be really good to see what, what each of them would, you'd be looking what it, at. What it looks like, yeah. right? You know, this is yeah. sort of, and again, it's a journey and, and we want to make sure that um, everyone understands, parents and practitioners, practitioners alike, just like kids, every single child on the autism spectrum has, has their unique path and how they got there, you know, Every single child with pans and pandas has a unique path to how they got there. And so they're going to have a unique journey of healing, right? So this is not, it's not a protocol, it's an approach, yeah. right? Um, so step one, treating the root causes, identify the triggers. These are some of the triggers, right? And there may be multiple. So that's where it gets confounding, right? Just like, you know, if your child has Lyme, they probably also have some other co-infection like mycoplasma or Bartonella, right? It's not, you know, if, if your child has pandas, they may also have heavy metal issues, right? You know, if your child has Epstein, chronic Epstein-Barr, there may be some mold issues there. So we, I, I look at the infections first because those are, you know, what we... Uh, understand how to treat the most effectively initially. And typically it is 
Oh, uh, typically, the infectious triggers are, are more prevalent. I mean, they, uh, at least from what we understand now. Um, and you could get really, really far by, by under, uh, identifying which infections. Um, and then there may be new triggers as your kids flare, right? So sometimes it's a cold or a flu bug that, that flares, but target the treatment appropriately. So what, if you have, um, you know, I think I wrote here. Oh, actually, I, I, I didn't write down all the different viruses and herbs and antibiotics because there's so many, right? Um, but, you know, if it's a bacteria, you want to use your antibacterial herbs or pharmaceuticals. If it's a virus, um, you know, and for strep, I commonly use azithromycin, right? Because azithromycin has its own anti-inflammatory benefit. So um, a lot of great improvements with azithromycin, but you have other options like OmniCef or, or um, uh, Septra. Um, do you have to just use antibiotics? No. Um, I typically start with uh, pharmaceuticals because I just want to really target and try to get rid of it at, or lower the burden as much as possible. But my preference is to move over into herbs and homeopathy when, as soon as I can, right? Because they have other supports. And of course, if you're just doing antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic, so many of our kids already have yeast issues, right? So what are we doing? We're, we're flaring their yeast issues. And I, I've had pandas kids where, you know, we get the strep down, but they're still ticking and there's still some OCD. So then we treat the yeast and it, and it goes away, right? So you can't ignore the constant, you know, kind of the side effects of our, of our treatments as well. But for viruses, not a lot of great pharmaceutical antivirals, right? You know, acyclovir, um, uh, Valtrex I have used, um, but we have some great herbals, right? And, and we have loricide and we have olive leaf extract. We have oil, you know, uh, oregano oil, um, grapefruit seed extract. So all of these have a role. Um, the treatment of Lyme and its co-infections, so complicated, right? I cannot go through <laughs> here in one setting, but that is an infection. You know, find a Lyme literate doctor, right? Find a doctor who's been trained by ILADS, right? And make sure that they understand all the different nuances of treating Lyme in kids. Um, Non-infectious triggers, you know, there's various ways to detoxify, but you, you have to detoxify as well, right? Um, identify and treat, you know, the carriers. This is important too, because I've had kids where, you know, we get them better and they flare and they keep getting strep. And we're like, why, where are they getting it from? So then you swab, right? Do a, a nasal swab, throat swab, and yes, a, a rectal swab, right? To check for all the different sources of strep. But it could be, you know, little brother whose immune system is different and can get strep or carry strep and not develop pandas. But you know, your, your child with pandas can't tolerate it, right? Check the parents. If grandparents or nannies or babysitters or friends, whoever is, is really closely involved in the care of your child, even pets, right? I've even had pets be, be strep carriers or carriers of other infections, which it's tough to find a vet, <laughs> you know, who, who may, you know, who uh, understands necessarily how to treat uh, test for that, but there are some. <laughs> um, reduce the frequency of illnesses. Right, we absolutely because kids with pans and pandas will flare when they get sick with other illnesses. Right, they'll flare when they have during cold and flu season. They'll flare when they get a flu, or they'll flare when they get a tummy bug. So lower the infection risk by washing hands frequently. At the end of the day, I use X Clear, you know, saline xylitol nasal spray to clear out whatever germs have um, started to take hold. And you know, I. I teach parents in my office and also um, with my new online course, right, the Everyday Holistic Pediatrics course, I go through all the different ways to boost your child's immune system, including specific supplements. But here are some of the top ones. You have to optimize vitamin D levels, right? Vitamin D is super important. Um, year round, our kids who have pans and pans, their immune systems are stressed. They are plowing through that vitamin D, right? So they need more, even if it's in the middle of summer um, and they're out in the sun a lot. Probiotics, um, phytonutrient-rich foods. You, you have to really optimize your diet. And I know during their flares, a lot of kids are restricting their foods. And many kids, if they already have the sensory or the autism, right? They're, they're restricted anyway, but, you know, try your best in reducing those refined sugars and getting out those colors, right? Hopefully most of you listening have already done that, but the artificial dyes and the preservatives and, and um, uh, the flavors, I mean, those literally are, are poison to your child's brain, especially when they're in this mode um, and sleep and exercise and nature, all of these things, stress reduction to help um, keep your child's system um, immune system boosted so that they can go out, be in school if they're still in school, go to parties without all of a sudden getting, going home and you start seeing that glassy eyed look and they're 
pupils are a little dilated because you're getting into that fight or flight mode of the infection flaring. And you're just thinking, oh my gosh, every day, you know, every party, a day or two later, we have a flare, right? So you want to try to reduce that and reduce exposures, right? This is where we just let the school know, have work with the school. I work very closely with, with many of the schools um, and I like to work with the schools because I want them to understand what is pans and pandas, right? Because the tricky thing here is that kids, it's, there's not really a baseline. You know, for your kids, you know, at baseline, they're gonna be doing great, right? They have, you know, their handwriting is great, their processing speed is great, they're doing their homework, they're happy and social, and then they flare. And they, they, they can't process, they need longer time, they don't understand the homework, their handwriting is gone, they're having rages or meltdowns in the corner. And so to have an IEP in place, well, what, <laughs> like, how do you have, you know, an IEP in place or a 504 plan in place that's gonna help your child through all of these ups and downs and, and have a flexible plan, but we need that in place. And for sure, the schools need to make sure that um, they're notifying families um, of immediate you know, strep exposures and other infectious um, uh, communicable diseases. Um, you know, I'll, I'll recommend to kids have their own school supplies at their desk. Their desk is cleaned, you know, at the end of the day specifically. Um, it's tough though, because, you know, as, as uh, most kids and adults, I mean, not, not most, all of us, we generally are the most infectious the day or two before we have symptoms. So it, this can seem like kind of an uphill battle, but, but if, you're, if you're friends or family who are obviously sick, then just say, you know what, we'll have a play date another day, right? We'll, we're gonna cancel dinner plans because we just can't risk another flare. And you know, friends and family, they'll understand, right? They, sh they should understand, right? putting out the fire, reduce the inflammation, whatever way you can. And we may need to do this repeatedly. We have different options, pharmaceutical options. You know, one of the things I'll do if I'm not sure if my kid has pans or pandas, I'll do a trial of ibuprofen. You know, ibuprofen three times a day for a week. If all of a sudden your kid is more calm, regulated, um, you know, sleeping better, you know, less fearful, um, you know, handwriting is improving, then, then, then I have a suspicion huh, it wasn't clear that this was PANS, but if they're improving with ibuprofen, I know there's inflammation driving some of these symptoms, so now let me do some digging. Okay, so that's a little trial you could do at home, right? Or as a practitioner, you can recommend this trial um, just to see. Um, I do use steroids like prednisone just in the same way we would with a child with asthma if they're having a really bad asthma flare, anywhere from a three to five day burst if the inflammation is really bad. But then we want to add on our herbal you know, options, right? Omega-3 essential fatty acids is really important. Curcumin um, can be very helpful at reducing uh, brain inflammation. Antioxidants like glutathione and your vitamins A, C, and E, and quercetin really, really important. Um, additional anti-inflammatory supports. I talked about the diet to really boost the immune system, but this is really important. When your kids are inflamed, you you want to. It's it's thinking about your child's inflammation as an inflammation bucket, the same way we think about an allergy bucket, right? The more we can just get out all the other sources of inflammation. If your child still has this infection, but we get rid of the inflammation from these other sources the inflammation from that infection isn't necessarily going to be spilling over all the time, right? So hopefully that makes sense. But, you know, the dyes, the processed foods, the sugars, the gluten, um, uh, heavy metals, exposure in your child's diet, really important. Stress reduction, super important because stress creates inflammation just the same way all, all these physiologic <clears throat> factors do. And I have some apps for you. I have a resource page at the end as well. Um, but I just wrote here, I mean, this is so important. I hope, you know, for anyone who's watching this, they're already doing this, but, but there are many studies that are confirming the, the harmful effect on our kids' behavior and attention um, uh, with, from artificial flavors and preservatives and dyes. And so um, I actually wrote a, this is one of my first blog posts on the Healthy Kids, Happy Kids page because it's such an important issue um, that parents don't understand necessarily that just that, you know, that little package of Skittles at the birthday party that could actually be contributing to this huge flare that your child is having, right? And in the European Union, all foods that have these artificial foods and uh, dyes and preservatives have to have a warning label on them that that food can cause adverse reaction uh, um, effects on activity and attention in kids. Yeah, it's amazing he, how in uh, some countries those things are there and others they aren't. I know, I know. Not enough countries.
Yeah. Um, and then keeping the fire down, this is where you may, uh, you likely will need to have a functional medicine doctor who can work with you because some of these are not going to be things that you can necessarily do on your own. But this is really important because you can get your child to a place where they're in such a great place, but now we don't want to be holding our breath and walking in eggshells the whole time that, that you know, the next shoe is going to drop and they're going to flare again. So modulating the immune system to reduce the frequency of flares and really and truly hopefully gain permanent remission, right? But these are things like IVIG can be very helpful, but you, you, you have to work with the practitioner for this. This is not something you can't just order IVIG treatments yourself. Low-dose naltrexone and these uh, factors called specialized pro-resolving mediators. Also, you know, a practitioner can help you with. I found those can be um, total game changers. Um, but CBD oil, very helpful. Remember I mentioned before that the TH17 immune system is uh, involved um, in, the, in the pathophysiology of pans and pandas. Well, CBD oil and Chinese skull cap, it's got to be Chinese skull cap, not American skull cap, but Chinese skull cap and CBD oil can both help balance that TH17 part. Um, so, so those are things that you can try. And all of these other core clinical imbalances, right? You want to find a functional medicine practitioner to help you navigate the nutritional insufficiencies, right? The gut dysbiosis and leaky gut that, that they likely have to start with, but can occur just as a result of our treatments, right? With these antimicrobials, even if you're using herbs um, that can cause gut dysbiosis, mitochondrial dysfunction, detoxification issues, and then the other imbalances that the history might point to. Um, and so we'll just go a little bit into that, right? Healing your child's leaky gut, really important, right? Healing the gut dysbiosis. Um, you know, if, if uh, people who know, you know, my work, I mean, and functional medicine, you know, all health really is tied to the gut. Health starts in the gut. And so you need to keep your child's gut healthy, right? So these are the five R's and I'm not going to go through them in too much detail, right? But, you know, removing anything that's inflammatory to the gut, um, including the gut bugs, some kids will harbor strep in their gut without having strep in their throat. And if you don't do a functional stool analysis, you're not going to know. And it's the strep in the gut that's causing the, the panda symptoms. Um, but, you know, glyphosate is Roundup. You know, um, that, that directly is going to cause gut dysbiosis, these pesticides um, and leaky gut, heavy metals, EMS replacing what's missing, like digestive enzymes, re-inoculating with all those good probiotics, repairing the gut lining with glutamine, zinc, and fish oils, and rebalancing, restoring that gut, mind, body, spirit connection with sleep and exercise and mindfulness. Um, and I just wrote here for you guys, I have a little a, a, a guide that I just an infographic on healing your child's leaky gut with the five R's um, to just make it really easy for you guys to know um, what, what those five R's were that I just went over super fast, <laughs> but is really what I do a lot in my practice, right? Yeah, and I'll make sure our links below so people can okay. click through. Um, and then mitochondrial function. Our kids on the spectrum, many of them have mitochondrial dysfunction. And, um, and I know, I, was it Dr. O'Hara who spoke about mitochondrial dysfunction last year? Who She's, she's amazing. Um, but if your child has low core muscle tone, they're tiring really easily. Um, they, you know, and so they may have underlying mitochondrial dysfunction, but the infections themselves can also cause mitochondrial stress. So your child may have been a star soccer player, could play two soccer games back to back, no problem, go home and still jump on the trampoline. But since they're sick, they just, they're struggling. By the end of the soccer game, they're crashing, right? And they're just not able to do what they could do from an endurance standpoint. Think mitochondrial issues right? Uh, because mitochondria, those are our energy powerhouses. They create cellular energy and we need that for our kids to, their immune systems to fight the infection and to heal, right? Um, and if you notice, I put here on altitude, if your kids do worse when you go skiing or when you go on a plane or you go into altitude, that's a sign that their mitochondria are being affected likely, right? And they need more mitochondrial supports. And so those are things like CoQ10, or carnitine. And then we need an lots of antioxidants because when our mitochondria are stressed, creates free radicals, which create more inflammation to our brain. So um, free radicals uh, get mopped up by antioxidants, right? Colorful fruits and vegetables, right? Extra vitamin C, glutathione, vitamin E. And detox, right? I mean, our kids are building up these toxins 
from the from the bugs that are inside them, but also likely holding on to more toxins as well. And of course, the medicines and even the supplements we're giving them can create a little bit more of a toxic load. So we just want to make detoxification a lifestyle, right? Minimizing the exposures, but then we're maximizing our roots of sort of excretion, right? They got to be peeing a lot just to keep them hydrated. They have to be pooping regularly, right? So get that magnesium on board. You have to be sweating. So lots of exercise, right? You can do green smoothies with amazing detox uh, greens like cilantro and parsley and chl chlorella, Epsom salt baths because that enhances glutathione for detoxification support, and sleep. Sleep, so key because we detoxify in our sleep. Our brain um, shrinks to almost half its volume and it's bathed by its own lymphatic system. It's called the glymphatic system um, to take out all those toxins that have been accumulated during the day and to reset and, and, uh, and kind of relearn um, what it should. Um, so sleep is key. And then you might consider supplements like glutathione. I mentioned a ton, right? You can see glutathione is important <laughs> and, uh, or milk thistle, supporting and protecting sleep. Right. So these are, I talk, I mean, it doesn't matter if your kid has pans or pandas. I talked about this with every single kid and teenager who comes into my office, but especially if they're sick with something like pans or pandas or other chronic illness. Um, there's the blue light from their screens. That phone has to be out of their room, right? Just off, out of the room, reducing the EMF exposures, reducing the blue light exposures. And if they need to be working on their computers for their homework at nighttime, um, wearing those amber um, blue light blocking glasses or having a, a screen, you know, I use Flux, F dot L-U-X, that automatically I can, I download it to my computer and at um, my time zone, you set your time zone, right when the sun is starting to set, the screen gets a natural amber glow to it, right? Um, and they, these are some ideas for sleep supports, right? Cortisol, you know, if your kids are in that fight or flight mode at night, get that second wind, like a lot of us do as adults, phosphatidylserine is really helpful. Um, I do use melatonin. Melatonin actually is neuroprotective, but I do use melatonin to help kids fall asleep if that's the issue. But some kids fall asleep fine, they don't stay asleep, in which case inositol may be helpful. And this is where I use my, my you know, natural medicines toolkit. I use my homeopathic medicines like Cafe Acruda or Ignatia and essential oils to help with sleep. Um, these are just different ways to minimize toxic exposures, right? And, and many of you already know, have gone down this route and are, are intimately, you know, uh, uh, aware and knowledgeable of the Environmental Working Group's recommendations, right? Um, but minimizing those inflammatory sources. Remember, we're trying to lower our kids' inflammatory bucket, right? Um, so from the foods we're eating, to the air we're breathing, to the stuff we're putting on their skin, to the stuff we're cleaning the house with, right? Um, and, you know, do you have to go crazy with this? You, you can, I, you know, but I don't want you to, right? I want you to really um, do one step at a time, right? You know, because talks like this can be so overwhelming and you just think, oh my gosh, I need to, you know, get rid of everything in the house. How am I going to do this? And you get overwhelmed. And then a lot of us just don't end up doing anything, right? Because we just want to do it perfectly. Or we get so overwhelmed, we do do everything. And then our adrenals as mamas get shot. We're grumpy. We're sleep deprived. We're not, we're not able to help our kids as well, right? So pick one thing at a time that you can do and do that and then move on to the next, Right, and then just look at your house, you know, and see what what are the biggest sources. If you don't have a lot of plastics in your house, and you know you don't have a lot of um, you know kind of uh, toxic toys, then what is one area you could clean up? Maybe it's just getting green plant, you know, plants in your house to to clean the air, right? Um, or getting an air purifier. So there are there are um, ways that we can make this not um, overwhelming, right? Absolutely. And then the last step is restoring that body, mind, spirit connection, right? It is really important that kids have a therapist um, that can work with them um, and do cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the most effective treatments for kids with PANS or PANDAS. Um, working with the schools on that medical behavioral plan, right? Because they, they are going to have medical needs and behavioral needs in school. Um, children with PANS, it's incredible. They're twice as likely to be unschooled and actually have an unplanned homeschooling or unschooling event occur, right? And so 
um, parents and uh, the schools need to understand how to support our kids. Um, family counseling for parents and siblings. And I mentioned siblings a lot because, um, you know, it's so hard when you're, you know, you have that, um, this one child who's so sick and has so many needs and so many doctor's visits and so many therapies. And then you have, you know, your sibling who's great and helpful and, you know, really, you know, so helpful to their sibling and to you. And so, you know, it's not that you're ignoring them, but, but, you know, their, their needs, are, they're not expressing their needs, right? Because they may not want to rock the boat and make it harder for you or whatever it is, but getting that sibling support, right? If you can, in fact, you know, there is, um, um, uh, here at Stanford, I, I did hear, I haven't, I don't know if it's still ongoing, but there was a, um, a support group for siblings of kids with pants. And there, I know there's a support, support group for um, kids of siblings with autism, right? Um, and then you can use some other neurologic calming agents if needed. This is where I go to my homeopathic medicines. I go to my essential oils, right? But sometimes if your child is in um, a really anxious state or in a really aggressive state, um, you may need to consider medications temporarily, right? And I say temporarily because it, that's just to kind of, you know, put a quick Band-Aid on things to stabilize, get them into the therapies, get their brain less inflamed, and then, and then we can, you know, wean them off. And then find a community because so many families do get isolated, right? So even if you don't have a community of, um, you know, uh, friends who can support you or family who can support you and understand what's going on there we're we're in this day and age where social media it's like this this harmful thing on the one hand but this great thing on the other hand and i think as far as building community that then yes we have these groups of you know pans and panda support groups that you can find your online virtual community of parents you know around the world right um and the pandas network as well you can join and be part of that community um, and so, you know, in terms of practicing mindfulness, you could do it anywhere, right? But this is really important because when your kids are, uh, these are my kids, <laughs> when your kids are um, not flaring, they can practice those mindfulness tools so that they become more of a habit. And when they are flaring and their brains aren't working, you know, as well as they, they can, they can still, they access that, that piece more easily, right? And so, you know, one of my favorite authors, a uh, psychologist, um, is Dawn uh, Huebner, H-U-E-B-N-E-R, and her, she's got a whole series of what to do books for kids to teach them cognitive behavioral techniques um, to help themselves, you know, when they're worried or stressed. Um, so she's, she has what to do when you worry too much, um, and also Outsmarting Worry, which is a, kid, a book for older kids, like teenagers. Um, but I, you know, she's got what to do when your brain gets stuck, which is really for those OCD, you know, um, uh, moments. Um, what to do when you dread your bed, because a lot of kids are having sleep issues and they never did before, right? What to do when, when your temper flares, right? So she, I mean, she's great. Um, I, as much as I want kids to not be on screens, uh, because you know, when, when your brain is, uh, is not functioning well, when there's inflammation and this, um, you know, you're, literally their brains are on fire, so many of our pans and pan kids, you know, they just, they cannot let go of the iPad. They cannot let go of the iPhone and they become obsessed with that. And literally it's like this, this craving and this addiction. Um, and so, but there are apps like Breathe for Kids and Calm that I think is, is a way that if your kids, if you can take that screen away, you know, during that time or use it when they're not flaring, right? When, when it is a little easier to say, you know, hey, Mikey, it's time to be done with screens and there's not that, you know, ten, you know one hour rage, right? Um, so Breathe for Kids and Calm are two great apps. Um, and then, you know, Amy Saltzman, she's one of my neighbors here, but she teaches mindfulness-based stress reduction to kids and, and teenagers. And so she has these really great workbooks and CDs for them. Um, and then the last piece, the integrative care, I did mention this before, just be open, you know, to all the different uh, modalities and, you know, hopefully what I recommend though, because uh, for many parents, they can end up um, having like five or six different practitioners that they're working with and it becomes overwhelming and who do you listen to? And especially if they're giving maybe sometimes conflicting advice, right? Or different herbal recommendations or different, you know, homeopathic recommendations. Um, so, you know, try to, and this may shift over time, but at any moment in time, try to really have one of those practitioners be your lead, right? And I tell parents, you know, I love working in a team. It doesn't have to be me. I will take no offense if I'm not your lead, but choose someone to be your lead that you're going back to, that they're, they're helping to kind of to 
keep that big picture look, you know, at the plan um, and support you. And they're that they they are your point person, and that point person may change, you know, as your child goes through their journey. But but you want to really have have one person be kind of the main person who is your go to, and then have your team around you, right? Um, so that's it. I know I, I, I speak fast. I give a lot of information, but the slides are there. You know, I, I, that's why I have the slides because um, there's a lot of information there uh, for you guys. And I just put down to just the different um, different ways that people can see, um, you know, what I do. It's really going to be the Healthy Kids, Happy Kids uh, blog site and Facebook page um, where, um, you know, Anywhere in the world that you are, um, you can access uh, the resources that, that I provide. Um, and then Tara's going to be at my next Thriving Child Summit. I can't wait, but that's coming up. I, I've hosted two Thriving Child Summits um, in 2016 and 2017. We're kind of revamping and shifting. It was such a great way to get this functional medicine integrative uh, pediatric information you know, out to parents everywhere, just like this summit is. Um, and so I'll, I'll be uh, hosting my third one in 2019. So definitely uh, be on the lookout for that. Yeah, well, and it's a fabulous summit. And of course, it has a wonderful name. <laughs> um, I always said it, it, uh, it's, it's the, it's the perfect, it's the perfect naming. I, uh, first of all, that was amazingly comprehensive and I hope it wasn't too overwhelming, but I no, just wanted to hit all the highlights. I, I think, well, and, and the thing is, is that as we talked about, a pants and pandas is very complex, but what I loved about it too, is that, um, all the things on the, the, the back end of your, your, um, the conversation here was it allows us to, um, uh, to, to, that you can apply that to everything, it, you know, everything yes. that we're doing with our kids, because it yeah. really is about getting yep. to those root causes. And the last step that you talked about in terms of integrating care, that is, I think you nailed it on head. It's really hard to know who to listen to and who to talk to. We are having a couple speakers on the summit this year to talk about how to do that and yeah. how they run an integrated practice and with multi-modalities yep. in building and, 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 and how we can, as parents can, can figure out how to do that. But I think you gave some really great advice in terms of finding that lead and, and um, going, starting there at least to, to, to reduce the overwhelm of all the things you're going to need to do to make yes. the kids healthy yes. again. So, yep. Yep. I'm going to stop the share so I can see you. <laughs> um, but, but it is, you know, it, it is absolutely, um, Oh, you know, I, I feel for mamas and papas and grandparents, and it's just usually the mamas, right? Because, I mean, this is your child, right? This is, this is your baby, and you're up, I mean, just all hours of the night, you know, every day of the, of the week, right? You know, every week of the month. And so, um, you know, this is, you know, just in, even going back to reducing the toxic exposures, the whole idea of just taking it one step at a time, right? And, and cutting yourself some slack and not feeling like you have to do it all, um, finding that support group. And, and just as much as, you know, I'm, I'm saying prioritize sleep and prioritize the mind-body connection, it is so important for parents to do that for themselves, especially the mamas, mm -hmm. right? Because you may be up till three or four in the morning doing all of your research and connecting with other people on, on your Facebook group, but you're still going to have to wake up in two hours to make the breakfast and pack the school bags and, you know, coordinate with, you know, with pickups and drop offs. And so, um, you know, think about it as don't necessarily think about it as, as self care, although I want you to honor and, and do self care for yourself. But think about it as really just as therapeutic for your child, right? Because, you know, any of these, right, autism, ADHD, sensory processing disorder, pans or pandas, there's no quick fix. There's no, I mean, really for any condition, right? There's, there's no magic bullet. You're not going to find that one answer in those, you know, eight hours of research you do at night, that one night, right? You need to get sleep and you need to be there for the long haul for your child, right? I mean, for those ups and downs and, and, you know, and that journey and that journey includes you, <laughs> right? And so, you know, this is where, um, I've, you know, I have told mom sometimes when I'm seeing them coming in and just, so frazzled and I can tell they're, they are, you know, in more of a fight or flight on edge than their child where I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll literally, you know, write a prescription and tell their partner, like, you need to shut off your computer and not look at it for, you know, two days and just sleep, right? Get eight hours of sleep every night, right? And then after that, 
go back in with, you know, kind of freshness and, and, you know, reinvigorated to do some of the research and get back on maybe some of the supplements. Or if you're getting overwhelmed, sometimes mm -hmm. I say just back off completely, mm -hmm. right? And then just give yourself a break, give your child a little break, get a new baseline, and then, then move forward, right? But, but I want this to be, to really be a message of hope and a message of sort of, you know, doing this together for the long haul, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, it, I, it, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think it's one that most parents can relate to because they're been struggling for a really long yeah. time with their kids. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for all this. Uh, you did mention your, um, your course. So I, do you want to just tell everybody a little bit about that? Because I think it's a really helpful tool to parents that are trying to do as much as they can at home with their kids um, to, to really get them to understand some of the supports they can put in place for them. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a link for that too, so parents know exactly how to find it. But um, this is called Everyday Holistic Pediatrics, and it's it's basically the course that I've been teaching in my office every year to families. Um, I mean, for uh, like ten years now. So, um, but even better. <laughs> so I brought it online so that you know, even if you don't have an integrated pediatrician near you, anyone can access it. Um, and so it's it's currently 10 modules. I'm in the process of you know trying to add on more modules, but um, it's it's a holistic pediatric approach to um, the most common childhood conditions, acute conditions. So uh, the first module, we go all through the different natural medicines that I use and some of the evidence also behind their safety and their efficacy. So I go through homeopathy, acupressure, essential oils, um, herbal medicines and supplements and how to safely use them, right? Because I think, uh, you know, for, for, Many of us, unless you grew up in a household where our, our parents were giving us herbs and using homeopathy and essential oils, we just want to know that what we're doing for a child, we want to use natural medicines. And I would say probably, you know, uh, anyone listening on the summit um, doesn't just want to use pharmaceuticals, right? But we want to know that it's safe and we want to, we want to know how to give it and how to dose it. Um, and so that's where, you know, as a pediatrician, I wanted to make sure that I give parents that security, right? That comfort and, and that evidence as well that these can be done really safely. So we go through what our natural medicines toolkit is and how to use it, um, go through a whole module on, on immune boosting, right? Because again, we want our kids to be healthy um, and not get sick as often, right? I go through um, how to know when your kid needs antibiotics because there's a time and a place for everything, right? And sometimes your kids do. So how do you know when that earache needs an antibiotic or not? Um, and also what to do if your child does get antibiotics to heal their gut. And then, I mean, my favorite part of it is the, mod, the, the condition-specific modules where uh, we go through um, how to use herbs and supplements, diet and lifestyle, homeopathy, acupressure points, and essential oils for specific conditions. Fever, colds and flus, coughs, um, ear aches, vomiting and diarrhea. Um, and this is where, you know, I'll be adding modules on um, sore throats, um, acute skin conditions like hives and sunburn and first aid things like bonks and bumps and sprains and, you know, head bonks. Um, so I love it because then, you know, people can access this anywhere, even when they're traveling because it's all online. Uh, and so, and we've had a great um, uh, Everyday Holistic Pediatrics Facebook group uh, for parents of the course so that they can uh, support each other. That, that, that's fantastic. Uh, that's, that's why I wanted to talk to you about it because I think it is such a great tool. We all could use it no matter what's going on with our kids at this mm -hmm. point in time. It's something that everybody, all of our kids get sick from time to time and, and all these things like immune supports, they can be used and um, you can understand them better for, yep. for everyone. Yeah. Yep. And uh, you know, with every, all the supplements that, that I recommend, um, I also give um, specific brand recommendations because that's also what parents want to know too, right? Okay, so there's a probiotic. Which probiotic? Because right? there's a yeah. gazillion out there. And it's not to say that the, the ones I recommend are the only ones, but I give suggestions, right, as a starting point because that way you know, okay, the, the brands that I recommend, I actually have research and, I, and in my clinical practice and with my own kids have used, so I know that they work. That's, that's amazing because like you, you said, specific recommendations are always helpful when you're just getting yes. started with these things for sure. Yeah. 
Well, I can't thank you enough because today has been incredibly informative and um, I'm sure that many people have learned lots about what they should be looking for and what they can do about it if they think that their child has pans or pandas. And so thanks again for doing this with me. Thank you.